I was 3,000 miles away when I got the call that made me fall to my knees. I got a call from my daughter. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My daughter was such a beautiful person. She was filled with so much love and compassion. And she was what I used to call my little mother, Teresa. But that call, when it came in, it just took my breath away. When you get a call from your kid and you can't control what you're hearing, you really have to sit back and think. You have to think about what is actually happening here. What am I hearing? My daughter was calling me to tell me that she was in trouble. She was calling in 2012, to be exact, to tell me that she had been arrested. She had been arrested for armed robbery. She had gone in with two co-defendants because she had been hooked on a drug, and it was called Molly. This drug got her so far out there that even I didn't know who she was. Things began to change. This was my daughter. This is what she looked like before it all happened. And this was my daughter after. Let me tell you something, the drug Molly can change your very entire existence. And it did that for her as well. I was so shocked to hear what I was hearing and I just, I just, I couldn't even imagine and fathom what was happening. That my life and her life was changing right before our very own eyes. And all I could say to myself is, why? Why is this happening to us? Why is this happening to a college student? A student who was doing so well in life and then all of a sudden, phew, overnight, it's gone. I don't know if it's ever happened to you guys but it definitely happened to me. How many of you guys have someone who's incarcerated, you know someone who's incarcerated, or God forbid your own child is incarcerated? I'm glad to know, one, I'm not alone, but two, I wanna thank you for being bold, and three, I want you to realize that I realize some of us won't raise our hand for, for many different reasons. I understand that, you know, there is, a, there is a major, major, major stigma that goes along with being incarcerated. I understand that there's judgment that occurs. And some of us are ashamed. Some of us are even embarrassed to admit that. But you know, I have to admit even I was that person before my daughter was incarcerated. I was that person who looked at a criminal and said, I should be afraid of that person. Not only should I be afraid of that person, but I also should look at them as once a criminal, always a criminal. They'll never change. So don't give them a second chance. Just throw them away. I was that person, and I am terribly ashamed to admit it. But the reality is there's many of us sitting right here in this room, sitting out in the world, who think just like that because it didn't happen to you. It doesn't affect your world. It doesn't you don't even know anybody in your world or in your society or in your culture or in your family where it's actually affecting you. But for me, it affected me. And so it hit me so deep down in my heart that I had to dig deep down in myself and say to myself, hmm, let me find out for my daughter what's going on around there. So I started asking my daughter questions. I started asking her simply, what's going on in there? And she started giving me stories that were unfathomable. Stories that were just mind-blowing. I could not believe that they were in fact true. I thought to myself, there's no possible way, no possible way that what you're telling me could be true. So what that did was that led me down a road that opened up another door for me. And as this door began to open, it opened in a way that is, is unique and is probably going to blow some of your minds. But for me, it worked. And it, it actually helped me to understand what my daughter was going through. How many of you guys have seen the show 60 Days In? It's a jail show on A&E. Anybody? 60 Days In. Do you recognize that person right there? That's me. I hope you like my braids. <laughs> but um, that show, 60 Days In, um, they basically came to me and they said to me, you know, would you like to know what it's like to be in jail? And I said, well, how would I do that? And they said, well, you're going to spend 60 days undercover in jail. This is going to be the real deal. And not only is it going to be the real deal, we're going to document every move that you make. And you're going to go in there completely undercover to where nobody knows that you're in there. Not the staff, not the inmates, not anybody. How many of you guys would do that? 60 days? You going with me? Anybody? 
No, I guess not, huh? I don't blame you. I would never go again, and for the record, that would be a no. I'm never going back ever again. Um, I, I, while I was in there, you know, I uncovered a lot of different things, and some of the things that I learned were just, they, they were flabbergasting. I mean, I learned that there are three different types of people that go to jail and prison. And for the record, there's two different types of, of situations going on here. Jail is for people who go, and in two years or less, they may do their time, they may, be, may, they may not do their time, but jail they're in and out of. Prison is for long term, two years plus. And so when they sent me to jail, I learned that there were three different types of people. I learned so many lessons, but the, but the main lesson was that one, that there are people that are absolutely guilty, have made a mistake, they will learn from their mistakes, and they'll never go back again. I learned that there are people that are true criminals, people who will actually commit a crime over and over again. They're a menace to society, and we need to watch our backs when it comes down to them. I also learned that there are people that are innocent in the prison, innocent, falsely accused. They really didn't do it. And I know that's the famous saying, you know, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. But I promise you, there are people in there who really didn't do it. And so as a part of what I learned, I learned that, you know, you don't know somebody's story until you really know somebody's story. You can't judge a book by a cover. And I, why do I say that? Because I met a young lady. She was um, a heroin user. And she was my bunkmate, um, my cellmate, the girl that slept above me. And she had been prostituted since the age of eight years old. And the reason why she was on heroin was because her parents administered the heroin to her for these gruesome acts to occur. And some of us like to say, well, when you're on drugs, why don't you just get off drugs? It's that simple, right? It's that simple. Just say no. Well, have you ever considered the fact that some people have a disease? It's called addiction. Some people were raised in a culture they have no idea. They don't know anything else other than what they've been taught. She was eight years old, for God's sake, and being prostituted and being given heroin. And so as an adult, what does she do? She comes in and out of the system, in and out of the system, in and out of the system. That's heroin. That's what it does to you. You know what else I learned? I learned about why we should care about mass incarceration. The reason why we should care about mass incarceration, I want to show you a few more pictures there. Uh, Oh, by the way, that's me down at the very bottom. You see me at that bottom row? You love my mug shot? They could have picked the best shot ever. 60 days in, A&E, thank you so much. Why should we care about mass incarceration? You know, mass incarceration is killing us spiritually, financially, and socially. And until we really get a hold of the fact that it is a humanity issue, and it is it is a human rights issue, we won't begin to understand. You know, people's rights are being consistently uh, uh, broken and, and, and taken away from them. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't, condone, I don't condone crime, not at all. I do believe that when you've done something wrong, you do need to pay the price. But the crime, uh, the time must fit the crime. My daughter, for what she did for a first time offender, she should have never gone to prison for 10 years. 10 years, she was 18 years old first offense. Yes, she was guilty. Yes, she turned herself in. They didn't have to spend the tax dollars to find her. She turned herself in because she was taught to do what was right. She was born and raised in a family where I was in firm belief that she was going to turn out to be the good old American dream. But you know, sometimes we'll be pinched and woken up from that dream. And before you know it, you're in a nightmare. It can happen to you. It can happen. But human rights are being violated. I witnessed it with my own two eyes. Let's take a look. I'm volunteering to go to jail for 60 days. I have a child that is incarcerated. I wanted to know what it felt like to be on the other side. My biggest fear is that the prison system will fail my daughter, that she'll come out as a true criminal. I hope that I can impact that system. When I first came in, it was like the most eerie feeling that I've ever had. I would have never expected American jails to look like that on the inside. That was like some stuff that you would see in a foreign country. It's disgusting. If nothing else, I'll say disgusting. 
After years of building up my mental strength, I feel like it's being torn down in a matter of hours, minutes. I could never have understood what my daughter was going through, ever, until I walked one minute in her shoes being in jail. It's a financial issue, you know. It's a financial issue. I didn't know what it felt like until I walked in those shoes. When I saw from my own two eyes that human rights were being violated, I had to think, well, what else is happening? It's a financial issue. You see, one out of 35 people are incarcerated. One out of 25 children have parents who are incarcerated. $80 billion a year it costs to incarcerate 2.5 million people. We should care about mass incarceration. It's affecting you. Where do you think the $80 billion comes from? Your pocketbooks, my pocketbook, everybody's pocketbook. $80 billion. Hmm. I think $80 billion could probably pay the price of every teacher in America for the next year. Why don't we take the time to possibly think about using this as a way to kind of better society, to see what else we could do to make things better. Because at this present time, we're not doing what we need to do with the money that we're spending, but we're expecting different results. I think Einstein said it best when he said, you know, we keep doing the same things, but we keep expecting different results. That's called insanity. And I feel like we're walking in a space of insanity when it comes down to mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is not just a humanities issue and a community issue. It's also, a, I'm sorry, a financial issue. It's also a community issue and ultimately a family issue. Did you know that 77% of those who've been incarcerated are actually coming back out to society, no matter what they've done, no matter how long they've been in, or no matter what the impact is to the society as a whole? They're coming back. And since they're coming back, we have to be more than aware that uh, they're going to affect our neighborhoods. So we have to care about mass incarceration because it is a community issue. We have to realize and start to think differently. We have to start to think of felons as not just a, a, a burden to our society, but the potential that we could change the way the, the correctional systems are being handled. We should think about, are they coming out corrected? The answer is no. They're coming out worse off than when they went in. Why? Because there's absolutely no programs in place. We should start thinking about mental health programs, about re-entry programs. We should start thinking about all the different ways that we could actually begin to be a change. Have you ever thought about this? If you woke up tomorrow and you were told you have no money, you have no place to go. You have no one to ask. Now put yourself there. Imagine it with me. You have nobody. Not Grandma Susu, not Billy Bob, not Uncle Shook, nobody. But yet you are told to be a productive citizen. What are you going to do? What do we expect people to do when they have no uh, where to lay their heads, nowhere to get a meal, no way to get a job? That's what we're doing to these people. We are saying, come back to society, but you figure it out. But don't do anything wrong, but come on back. That's what we're saying. Why should we care about mass incarceration? We should care about mass incarceration because, you know, because the bottom line is, is that we are our brother's keepers. We are our brother's keepers and our sister's keepers. It is up to us to be the, the, the leaders and the forerunners in the world of change, not just talk about change, but be about change. Because I never expected this to happen to me. I am not the face of incarceration, neither is my daughter, but it is happening. The opioid crisis, is, it is here. It is now. It is happening. So what can you do? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me. Ask again, what can I do? Well, what you can do is you can remove the stigma and talk honestly about it. See, in today's time, there's no real ways that we can talk about this and not feel totally uncomfortable. I mean, I'm squeaming and I'm standing up. I can't imagine what you're doing in your, in your, in your chairs right now. 
I'm really uncomfortable talking about this subject because most people, as soon as you start talking about this subject, the, the, the first thing they want to do is shut it down. They want to ignore it. They want to push it away as the dirty, dark subject. But we have to start talking about this thing openly and honestly so that we can find the, uh, the solutions to the problems. Don't we talk about other problems? And don't we find solutions? This is a problem. We need to find a solution. What about educating ourselves? If you haven't already done this, and, and, and I'm proud of you if you have, but if you haven't already done this, the best way that you can educate yourself is just like I did. You can stand up and you can sign the Justice Declaration. I, when I went to that uh, Justice Declaration, Dot com, and I started learning about things. I learned about advocacy. I learned about lobbying. I learned about what I could personally do to make a difference because the problem does feel like it's this big. But these people, which is the prison fellowship, I'm in no connection with them, but they did help me to pull myself through and make me understand specifically what it was that I needed to learn and do to become a change agent. So my question to you is, will you sign the, Je the Justice Declaration? Will you sign it? If you will, you'll find out all the information that you'll need and you won't feel overwhelmed. You'll feel what I felt, and that's freedom. The freedom to know that we live in America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. The freedom to know that I personally had to go to jail to lose my freedom so that other people could be free, so that you all could understand and hear the truth coming from someone who has a biased opinion or who, is, who sees all sides. Will you say, will you stand with me and be the change that we need to be? Will you stand with me? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.